Well, it was a trip back to Carolina for Coach Rivera to go up against his former starting quarterback, Cam Newton. Coach Rivera said that it was fun being back in Carolina, but even more so to come out on top. Well, you can say that this entire Washington football team, for the most part, had their checks in balance. We'll talk about that and a lot more as Tony McGee's Pro Football Plus is coming up next. <laughs> This week on Tony McGee's Pro Football Plus, we are having our Geico National Reporter Show. We're bringing in some big hitters. So get you drink and come on back and enjoy the show. I think we're, we're getting a little feel for our guys. You know, we have some playmakers that have stepped up. You know, Terry McLaurin continues to make plays for us and doing the big, you know, doing the big things and doing the dirty work. Johnny Carter's kind of found himself in, inside our offense. You know, and and, and you, know, you got those those those, those guys like like Hump that just keep coming every day. Um, Cam Sims, another guy now that he's healthy, back out the field making plays. It's huge to be able to score before half and get that momentum going in. Um, I felt like we did a good job sustaining drives. A few of them we kind of stalled out. Um, the first one after the half, I believe, maybe. Um, but to be able to score, tie up the game, and know you're getting the ball in the second half, that's huge for us. Um, we want to be able to um, go in the half, make our adjustments, and come out firing. So um, I think we did a good job of, you know, sustaining drives, picking up third downs, and even fourth downs for Coach Rivera to have that type, type of confidence in our offense and for us to convert that. I mean, that's really huge, you know, because then you have a, you have a mindset of uh, it's four down territory. So, um, you know, hopefully we continue to keep this going. But, you know, I'm proud of the way of just not myself, but all the guys around me stepped up. It's fun when you see other guys making plays and, and the ball's flying around, touching to you know a lot of guys. And, um, that's what we want to need going forward for everybody to pitch in and, and hope to keep this thing right. I think last week was huge for us, confidence-wise. Um, you know, running the ball against those guys, and you saw today too. Those guys up front being really physical. Uh, running backs are doing a really good job. And our receivers are getting open. Um, you know, we have some guys go down with their offensive line and receiver, and they just continue to go out there and make plays. So. Um, you know, that's that's a lot of credit to the coaches, a lot of credit to those guys being ready, but I don't know, we, we just trust each other. And this week, our special guests on the Geico National Reporters Show, James Brown, host of the NFL Today on CBS Sports, Kelsey Nelson, Fox Sports, and radio and television personality, Rick Duck Walker. And now, Tony McGee. As I told you, welcome to Tony McGee's Pro Football Plus, but this is our Geico national reporter show where we bring in the best around the world not just the city we bring in the man now if you know who the man is his name starts with james <laughs> he is the man everybody know next you have to bring in the doctor the doc is the one going to be a physician and help us get through all this and you got donna with the source then we go out and we bring kelsey the real host there now she's hosting her own show but you always wait for the man that can have enough money that he can burn an elephant in a rainstorm, and he's cool at that time. We talking about G, Jerry Clark, <laughs> Homer. Welcome back. We waiting for Jerry Bell, but guys, we got something to have a little fun about. But we'll do that a little bit later. Washington Redskins, two. Oh, come on. I owe I owe money right now, guys. Oh, that's a lot of money right there, Tony. I, I, first time I've done it. The Washington football team have two wins in a row. We said a couple of weeks ago, and we'll start with you, Kelsey, since this is your first time being here. We said two weeks ago they were improving. What did you see with this team on Sunday that you saw was improvement? 
Oh my gosh. Well, first off, two wins in a row. When you looked at the schedule, Tony, at the beginning of the season, you didn't think these were the games that the Washington football team could win. But lo and behold, coming back from a bye, beating Tampa Bay at home, then going on the road and a, and a win that they fought they fought to win in that last play, stopping Cam Newton. And we saw the emotions that Cam Newton had. I mean, when he went to the middle of the field and did the Superman sword, I think Washington took that personal. And this was a personal win for this football team. DeAndre Carter said it after the game. They said this was a great win for our coach. And I think what we saw was a great team game on the offensive side of the game. The running game was great for the Washington football team. The defense got to show up, and especially on third down. And we know the defense has been a laughing stock around the league. Well, guess what? I live in D.C. and people weren't laughing today about the Washington football team defense because that's what we saw. They got this identity back and they look like we knew they could be on paper. And so right now I think we see a solid team win and now we see a confident team going in back home Monday night game to play the Seattle Seahawks. I think for fans, we saw everything that we need to see. I'm assuming that Washington won't be last now in terms of fan attendance because fans are going to get back in the seats because they, right now the Washington football team is proving that they're a team that is worth every dollar that you pay for for admission to see. So right now, Tony, we're seeing smiles, we're seeing confidence, and uh, yeah, we're seeing winning football in Washington that we like to see and uh, winning football that we're hoping can continue. Well, let's go to the big man and watch everybody every week. JB, if you look at these guys, do you see an improvement in them and do they have an opportunity you think to still win their division? Hey, Tony, and you know, I always preface my remarks with this. First of all, I'm talking with and to people who have put their hands in the dirt, who know the game exceedingly well, Gary Clark, Doc, yourself, Donna has been around and has learned a lot and also moved, broken a number of stories as well too. So my, all the years I've been blessed to do this, it's been from the position of asking the guys who've been there. I would never come off like I know the game so well. Now, what I can tell you from a big picture standpoint, that is easily understandable, Tony, and I look forward to hearing what the guys have to say about this. You know, heavens, for the longest time now, the league has engaged in designing parity in the league, where a team can go from the bottom to the top in almost one or two years with the kind of pieces they put in place because they can't hold on to players. Jimmy Johnson said it best years ago, when you're actually training guys in the four or five years that they're in your system, you're training them for somebody else because you can't keep them all. Number two, from my humble perspective, as I look at what was a very difficult off season, pandemic impacted, the guys couldn't get out there with a number of the team activities, uh, a limited preseason, and I've heard every coach say this, even though the players, and I'll be interested to hear what Gary and Doc have to say about it, the preseason really does give a coach a chance to see what kind of team they're going to have. But it's the first four games of the season where he finds out what he really has. And so, you know what, they didn't have a real uh, a, a aggressive offseason. So a lot of teams, a lot of coaches are seeing what they have now this late into the season. That's why virtually everybody is still in the running for a postseason berth, other than teams like Detroit, of course. But you see a number of teams. There's no dominant team out there to me. Everybody has a weakness. We've seen that come forth in terms of the expression on any given Sunday. Look at some of the teams that have knocked off the better teams because they're missing some players as well, too. So that's my big picture right now. Going into Thanksgiving, I'm doing a little preview that five of the six teams that are playing, other than Detroit, are all still in the mix, including Dallas, which got whipped the other day and did not look good. The NFC East leading Cowboys are certainly an indication of that. Well, you know, you look at it, Doc, and you look around the league as well, and let's, let's jump back to the Washington team right now. You see the improvement in them, and the thing that I see, what you see around the league, the teams with the good offense and defensive lines are the team that's starting to show right now. The skilled people are very good, as we know. But, Doc, when you look around here, look at this Washington defensive line. I have a question from Tamika out of the Geico. She said, did this line on Sunday play better than they played before with two individuals that are not starters in it? Doc, what do you think? Well, James hit it right on the bullseye. Two Hill, when I mentioned Williams and Two Hill, you got to go get a program if you don't follow the team but mm. we've never handled success well here 
because our management is so in flux. We've never really had a stability. What I'll give them credit for is when you go out and you pick a Bates up. See, to me, teams that win championships win from the fifth round to the seventh round. So they have value. They're able to balance the cap because they have good players. They don't have to pay yet. The bad teams always pick higher because they are bad annually. And they make mistakes because they have a low football IQ and they go after glitz and glamour. So we know it don't matter what round you drafted in, it's how big your heart is and how you practice. Well, we had a lingerie training camp where the coach didn't even play rookies in the third preseason game. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm like Lombardi. What the hell is going on out there? How the hell are you not playing a linebacker in a game? Lingerie, so his development, God, lingerie. His, his development was because of their ignorance, in my opinion. And so now he's developing because he's playing more. So it's always pilot error in this league because the league is it's just so many to have to have nots all on the same staff. So the less by reduction of number one draft picks, guys that don't want to get vaccinated, I'd get rid of all of them. Don't want to play a certain position. If Landon Collins, you don't play where I got you, you'd be gone. I can't win with you. Why in the hell would I be worried about trying to secure you? So finally, we're getting back to normal. And so now I expect these guys to prove who they really are. Well, you know, and you look at this team, and what I like about it is getting back to normal. You got the offense, defense, and special teams playing well. You've made some moves in the latter weeks that are looking really good right now. But, gee, I want to come to you with these receivers. I'm back, I'm still on Washington right now. Look like Carter has become the number two receiver on this team and the number two threat. He's definitely a big play factor. I mean, his punt return, kickoff return specialty is awesome, but he's making plays, and that's key. You want playmakers on your team, and he's definitely become one of them. You got somebody to help Terry Mack out, and quite honestly, Sims, Sims played well. To he made touchdowns, but he needed to make a touchdown as well, so you want playmakers on your team. Somebody may be carrying, Terry's going to probably carry the majority of the load this year, but to know that you got somebody to help take that pressure off of you when they are keying in on you, that's huge for them. That's happened the last two weeks in a row. And Donna, as you look at this right now, and we got to take a look at it when we talk receivers, let's jump over to the quarterback situation. A couple of weeks ago, you said keep Haneke as the quarterback. He's been playing well. He's still a 50-50 man, man. I gave him a V this week because he did some good things. But do you think that this could be the quarterback of the future for the Washington football team? Okay, Tony, pump your brakes a little bit. I won't go that far. <laughs> I, I think he, no, you went that far. Oh, don't no, bring it back. Say, I me. didn't say that the quarterback of the future was on this team, but let's take it for what it is. Uh, Teller Heineke is playing well the last two weeks. What you've seen with him is he settled down. Uh, he played, I mean, you know, his pocket play was better. We all were always knew that he could run the ball and, and get away. But as Ron Rivera said that he holds on to the ball a little bit too long, but overall, he likes what he's seeing. He said he's seeing the field, seeing what's there right now. And that's what he did in that Carolina game. But two plays, Tony, I want to talk about, about Teller Heineke. It's just before the half, Washington scored a touchdown. And, and the way they scored was brilliant because it was fourth down. He hit Carter for to extend that play on the fourth down play. Then he hit Humphreys. And then I don't even know how he threaded this pass into uh, McLaurin for the touchdown. And then they came back out after the half and scored another touchdown. And that's something that we haven't seen all season long. But as Coach Rivera said that it's not so much the skill plays, uh, the play of those guys, but it starts with the offensive line play and the defensive line play that has been the difference in this team moving forward. And Tony, I know you talked about the quarterback, but the offensive line, when you look across the offensive line, They've had so many injuries across the line, but Wes Switzer, he played center on Sunday against Carolina. He's been moved from the left side to the right side. And then you got Cornelius, Cornelius Lucas, who has also played well. So the offensive line is beat up, but they, they are playing pretty solid as a unit right now. And I think, like I said, take Teller Heineke for what it is. He's just playing good ball right now. He's settling in as the quarterback of the future. As I say, Tony, pump the brakes. 
Oh, you never did answer that question. He's not the quarterback of the future. You know that. <laughs> I'm, the you might well answer. I'm not letting you off. When you talk about the quarterback of the future, JB, I'm going back. This team a few weeks ago saw Tampa that we can beat Brady. Now, you're looking at Brady from, and, and Tampa from that game, and Emma from Geico have a question she wanted to ask. She wanted to ask you, do you think Tampa Bay is strong enough and with Brady can get back to – you know what, and and I, you know when to see those are the questions that I maybe it's a fault of mine because you know Gary and and Doc and you have been there. Look, from hopefully an edge. Wait, 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 JB, wait. Yeah. Me and Gary, me and Gary been there. Doc was here in the water. Okay, man. <laughs> hey, I got a ring too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Pull it out, Doc, and show him. He know. No, yeah. you know I got one, and I got paid too. So I don't care what. That's the best yeah. part of it. <laughs> hey, sorry, so fucking Gary and Tony, you all know I'm going to be paying respects to you guys. Hey, Tony, look, given the way that this season has gone, my my answer would be, why couldn't they go back and do it? But going back to a conversation that you guys had earlier on, which makes the point, you know, and this goes all the way back to when I was learning from Bobby Mitchell. God bless him. John Madden and everybody else who's ever put their hand in the dirt, <clears throat> it always starts in the trenches, the offensive line and the defensive line, period. Gary can't go do his thing if they're getting to the quarterback that fast. Doc being a, a, an all-around tight end as well. So it always starts in the trenches. And to Donna's point about showing an offensive lineman who can rotate along the line, that's a very valuable player. When we talk about quarterbacks, so the answer to our question is, sure, they can get back. But you know what? There are a number of other teams in that equation. If they get it together going down the stretch, they're capable as well. And again, I, I love hearing coaches talk about the first four games, although we got to add another game to the season this year. Usually the first four games, Tony Dungy was saying the same thing, is when you find out what your team is really like. The middle eight games, is what they call navigating the murky waters of the season, trying to stay healthy, trying to develop some type of momentum so that when you get to the last four games, again, I know we add another game to the schedule this year, that you've got some momentum going, hopefully relatively healthy, going into the postseason. Well, look at how late in the season now we're seeing some teams still struggle with that. Injuries absolutely is a factor. Many coaches will point back to what didn't happen in the OTAs and the preseason to explain that. But there's so many teams. We've heard people talk about the Buffalo Bills. Hey, how much are they putting on this young fellow, Josh Allen, although Leslie Frazier, and we better do our job talking about him because he has flat out been getting it done as a defensive coordinator there. Yes. Uh, you talk about uh, Taylor Heineke. Hey, you know what he has at least done for himself is get himself another five, six, seven years in the league if as a backup. Look at what the young kid down in Baltimore did coming in, uh, you know, a bigger, if you will, um, Lamar uh, Jackson. But look at what he did. He has shown that he's got the ability. Heineke, by the way, is bringing some intangibles to the table. I love the moxie of this young man. I love how he gets knocked down, but he picks himself right back up. He's showing some mental toughness. He may not have all these other things to be a bona fide number one, but he's showing me that he's got some more years in the league, just like the young fella Huntley down uh, in Baltimore did, he's shown that he should be here as well, too. Those are my thoughts. But, Doc, Gary, you all rip me a new one if I'm off base on that. Uh, no, you right on time on that. Why you ask the Doc? Like, you, what you ask the Doc about? <laughs> Come on, man. This ain't Tilly Weeks. This is football we're talking about. Milton, I'm sorry I ain't got to you yet, but I'm giving you time to say a prayer. And you know you're a homer anyway. But when we come back, Milton, I want to ask you about these running backs. Are they good enough to take this team where they need to be? You got the strong offensive line. You got a quarterback playing well. You got good wide receivers. But the running backs may be the key. And when we come back, ladies and gentlemen, when you said Heineke, he can get a backup job, which you guys do not realize, when he get one, he'll be making more than our starting quarterbacks did in the Super Bowl. We'll be back in a moment. Mm -hmm.
welcome back. And Tamika Adegaiko had a good question I thought was interesting because we've talked about it at the offensive line and everything, but running backs, everyone is concerned with the running back. But I like these running backs because they can do both things, catch, run, three things, and block. Milk, you've been watching these running backs. Are they strong enough, and that's what Tamika want to know, are they strong enough to really take this team where they need to go? Because when it gets cold and that offensive line is blocking, you need some strong runners and some runners that can run 20, 30, 40 times a game. We haven't seen that from this group yet. Is there one in that that will emerge, or will, it do, will they do it as a group? I think it's a good question, first of all, Tony. And I think because we're going more of a uh, running back by committee this year, uh, we've been able to be successful there and sustain once the trenches got together. Once the offensive line, I have to take my hat off to them. Uh, it looked like a revolving door yesterday, but they nef- never missed a beat. We had 190 yards uh, rushing on the ground. That's 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 a that's a that's a kudos for any team running. <clears throat> but I have to be a little hard here and say you don't fumble the ball in the red zone. You cannot. You can't do that. And unfortunately, Antonio Gibson, my guy, because. Last week, I indicated as a homer, all of them, my guys. But my guy, he cannot put that ball down on the ground, period, and much less the red zone. But if you take that away, 190 yards rushing, I thought was uh, was pretty good for this team. Are they strong enough? Uh, with seemingly a little nicked up right there. I think McKissick's got a little uh, nag, and, um, uh, and so does Antonio Gibson. But uh, as long as those things don't go haywire, I think that they can be consistent enough. Uh, I still like to see my guy Patterson get a few more reps. He had seven carries, 23 yards. So uh, Antonio Gibson had 19 carries, 95 yards. So if you increase his workload, uh, I'd be curious. As uh, I think it was Mike said it last week, he always seems to be one step away from going to the house. And I'd like to see, I'd like to have that opportunity. That The negative part about that, he got blown up by a linebacker. <laughs> yesterday uh, on, sure uh, uh, on pass protection. And so, you know, that's that's a trade-off. So uh, anyway, I like this. I like this running back room. I just think that we've got to be, uh, we've got to value the ball. We've got to be more protective of the ball. Hey, oh, Tony, yeah. let, can I jump in with the running back? What was interesting in that game is after Antonio Gibson fumbled the ball, they sat him down for the rest of that that first half. But then uh, uh, he they went right back to them him, him to, in the second half. And he had a strong game, probably his best game this season. But I think that Washington in that Carolina game established a run and stuck with it a little bit more than they had in previous games. But as Milton said, that he cannot put that ball on the carpet. He's had three fumbles this year. And, you know, they're still going to go with him. And I think that was good to throw him back out there after they settled him down a little bit. Well, you know, we're going to jump around a little bit. And Kelsey, I want to ask you this. When we talk about running back, I look at the game on Sunday with Tennessee involved. Here I am thinking Tennessee finally got themselves together. Now that the big running back is out, they got Peterson there. Do you think that this running back, Peterson, or anyone can help them get to where they need to to go? Because I did not think they would lose that game as they did Sunday. Yeah, I think that was a loss that surprised many people, Tony. Like many people are saying all things might go through Tennessee and many people are liking the Tennessee Titans and what they've done so far. And I think they have kind of been a surprise team that not many are talking about. But let's just be real, Tony, all right? We all know football on the show. No one can replace, I call him King Henry, right? Because Darren Henry can run that football. I mean, it's just, when he starts coming, I mean, it's unreal. I mean, he takes defenders with him. He's fast, he's strong, he can do everything. And he's the dream running back if you're a coach. And of course, Adrian Peter, Peterson, a legend, an icon in the game, and everyone knows, but he's just not the same AP. And I think when you take away Derrick Henry, he's just very hard to replace. And Tennessee relied so heavily on him. So I think when you take Derrick Henry out of the mix, and I think when you look at that game and you see why they lost, it's point blank period. And I think even they were surprised. And I think even they were stunned. And I think Tennessee is going to have to now go back to the drawing board if they truly see themselves as a team that can go far in this league. But again, Derrick Henry, he's Derrick Henry for a reason. He was talked about before he got injured as a possible MVP for a reason. Derrick Henry can change football games. You look at someone like Derrick Henry and what Alvin Kamara has been for the New Orleans Saints. And when he's out of the game for the New Orleans Saints, that's a different football team. And AK, I mean, he does everything for the Saints, right? He's a big part of that offense. So I think Tennessee, again, they're trying to rebuild. They're trying to rebound. But some people just aren't replaceable. And I think Derrick Henry has kind of proven that. Do I think Tennessee is done? No. But again, I think that game was a wake-up call for Tennessee, much like the Ravens' last game, losing to the Miami Dolphins was a wake-up call for that team as 
Well, I hope they have a wake up call, but Derrick Henry can make you change your career the way he runs. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> you gotta have a guy like that. You mess around and, and not having him, but as I look around and I look at this Washington team, I'm gonna jump on another strong part. That defensive line, and I'm going to you, Doc, because I, you've been watching them very good, very long. And I tell you what, the two defensive tackles, each and every week, they're getting stronger and stronger. Now, defensive lines around the league, one that I want you to tell me about, Doc, and I, and I know you've been watching them, and the team is starting to play well is San Francisco's defensive line. They are well, the whole back. team, yeah, the whole team was just a byproduct of they were hurt. And at every level, the great teams have an ex exceptional player at every level, D-line, linebackers, and secondary. Theirs happen to be right up the middle. So when you have three Pro Bowl talents like that, now everybody else that chips in that wants to get paid makes icing on the cake. This league is about having stars and having guys who want to be stars because you got it's so competitive you can't let an injury take you out of the picture. And the only reason an injury deflates your team is that you pick wrong backups or you don't practice hard enough. People aren't competitive enough. Competitive people, no matter selection of a draft, that's all. There's no direct science to it. Most NFL executives are moronic because they're friends and family. It's the worst development <laughs> of management in our culture because you get paid no matter how bad you are. So this, what they built insulates ignorance and allows them to keep jobs after failing year after year after year. That's how the Jets are the Jets. So now look at our four, you mentioned those Bulls, Ioannidis, Timmy, you got a Hokie, you got uh, Ioannidis, and you got those two Bulls. So we got four aces in the interior. Once the linebackers got their heads out of their behinds, now you got something going. Cameron mm -hmm. Curl's been there, but they yeah. had to get him on the field. So that's political. They got the players. Now the coaches are mirroring their minds and egos are now gone. You got your two poodles gone. They're out. And so now it's rock starty. It's about who wants to be a stud. And that's where, wait till you, you had a kid like Chaka Tony had a concussion. Wait till you get him back. Mm. See, all that hype, you don't want to come to practice, you want to do commercial, go do all of them. As a matter of fact, move to Hollywood because we don't need you if all you're going to do is run up field and run yourself out of the play. <laughs> now you got guys that are rocking steady. <laughs> that, and it's very simple. This ain't common. Doc, they got to go out there where they acting like a football player. Is that what you're saying? I'm just saying, <laughs> hey, you want to be in Hollywood, go, 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 go to L.A. And okay. Rick, you got Tony smiling because you're talking about the defense and he's been talking about the defense and the play he of the me. defense. No, no, no. He, Donna, I call him. Hey, oh. why is this boy not a three-point stand? <laughs> oh. Tony said, because he's an idiot. And then I said, what's the key to rushing the passer? Tony said, explosion, coming out of your stance, hand down, rear end up, explosive. The only man I've ever seen stand up be that good is Lawrence Taylor. This boy... He ain't got none of Lawrence Taylor's DNA in him. And I'm wondering, so he's telling the coaches what to do? Man, if they had somebody over there that actually understood football who was an owner, I'd run half a monitor. If you're going to let a kid be, first of all, you got to see on his chest. That's ridiculous. And you don't even come to a minicamp practice. He told you right off the top. I, it's about me first, then the team. See, and I'd run right up in there right there and rip it off of him. They did the same thing with Trent Williams. They, they, they're so poorly operated that this stuff seeps through. Until you lose four in a row, then things get tight over there. And a couple guys go out, now they playing. You watch what I'm telling you. It's the blind you have lead to the admit, blind. You have to admit they're playing well, too. And, you know, on that side of the ball, that defensive line is carrying this. And Gary, I got to awesome. come back to you on the offensive side. You got to say the receivers are carrying the offense right now. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think quite honestly, the line is doing well. And what I love about what's happening on the offensive line and the defensive line, key players went out, other players came in, and all of a sudden you don't miss a beat. You don't miss a beat. Guess what? Those other players, when they come back, they coming back to play because they showcasing you that, no, you got to win your job back for me now. I'm the guy now because I'm the guy that's coming in and making plays. 
When you have a team like that that starts to do that, that's when you got a football team because then everybody plays because I have to earn my job. I have to keep my job. If I ain't got anybody behind me that I got to worry about, you don't ever notice your game can kind of change because I ain't worried about it. <laughs> I worried about Ricky Sanders. Art Monk worried about Ricky Sanders. We both worried about Ricky Sanders. Why? Because we both know he could take our job if he needed to. That's why we made, him a, we made him a Thursday. He had to take either one of our jobs. That's <laughs> what Carter has done. Exactly. Like, yeah. You know, Andre Carter came out of nowhere. He came out of nowhere. Especially you know what I call him? I call him Baby, Gar Baby Clark. Oh, I call cool. Carter Baby wow. GC. He's the only cat out of the scene that reminds me of Gary. The kid out of North Carolina, too. No, he ain't ready for prime time. We bring I'm another up. kid over. He hurt. I don't play. Look, this man here, he never practiced, but he played in every game. So I don't care what he does during the practice session because I but know Doc, what he's going to do on game day. Doc, when, when, when he come in the room, does the temperature drop 30 degrees? Oh, what? <laughs> oh, but that, he, ain't, he ain't Gary Clark there. <laughs> <laughs> I said baby. I said baby, Gary. Yeah, cool enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what? But it's, you know but what it's I'm production. hearing during this whole conversation, though? We're seeing that the Worcester team is starting to develop where we want them to be. The facets are good and good, all three facets. When we come back, we'll talk specialty. But, JB, looking around the league, and I know you, you're always trying to give us accolades and stuff. You know more than all of us. We know that's why you're on the show right now. <laughs> yeah, no question. Don't fall know, for that. Look at, tell me what team would you be most afraid of if you met him in the Super Bowl right now? A team that reflects what you guys have been talking about. What I'm hearing in you guys, you don't see a lot of. First of all, I had no idea Doc could get this angry. <laughs> hey, hey, no, Jay, I'm not angry. I'm frustrated. No, 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 but not, no, no. It's an anger at folks people who are wet behind the ears trying to tell a coaching staff what they can do. Are you kidding me? Gary Clark represented what toughness was about. Man, you, you don't find folk going across the middle like Gary. Gary didn't care, Doc. And Doc, hearing you talk about the kind of toughness that you guys have, I don't see that in a lot of teams. You mentioned mm. San Francisco. Good if they point. get healthy and they decide to play physical and hard hitting, whole lot of guys' hearts going to go back over on the sidelines, you understand? So San Francisco would, would scare the daylights out of me if they get healthy and they get those guys back and they play with the kind of toughness. Um, Donna talked about uh, Derrick Henry. I think uh, Kelsey may have done that as well, too. Derrick Henry, I mean, to me, he reminds me of a modern Jim Brown. And y'all know the story about Jim Brown. Jim Brown used to run so hard. He'd be carrying five and six people with him, and the guys be, hey, Jim, could you please fall down? My kids are watching on TV. Same thing with Derrick Henry. He's dragging three or four people, and ain't no smile in his game. That's what you guys had back in the day, which yes. I'd like to see. So whatever team that you guys know better than me <clears throat> would reflect that kind of physicality and toughness is what's going to win and I'm not going to say because I don't want somebody to take this and run and say, oh, JB said this about this team that everybody's afraid of because they got track stars out there. You find me somebody who's not afraid to go up there and hit somebody in the mouth and keep coming at them. That's the team that's got a shot at doing it as far as I'm JB, concerned. just for the record. Yes, sir. That was no Venus question. Oh, what? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Ain't no way in the hell that was told. Let's just get I the say record straight. Right? Right? Yeah. Yeah. That was Novena McGee's question. So hey, let's Tony, get this Tony, a question, <laughs> for, Tony, a question for you. A, a question for you. What has happened to Buffalo? It seems like the wheels has fallen off that team in the last three or four weeks because I think they lost, what, two back-to-backs, three of the last four games? What's happening with Buffalo as far as the defense and the offense because – those wheels are rolling on down the field, and and they they seem not to be able to win right now. And Where's the running game in Buffalo? Where's the running game in Buffalo other than the quarterback? It's oh. still a, you know what? Back when these guys played, and before then, the ground attack is still key. I'm sorry, Tony. Donna gave you that question. No, no you I answered it. Get it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't right. answer it any better? Hey, hey, Doc. Uh, uh, we're gonna. Put James in anger management. management. <laughs> <laughs> we come back. We're, we're put talking Novena about in a little square. bit. Now, hey, we, put Novena James, in one of these boxes, James, man. Uh, James, Let her go direct. James, 
<laughs> you and Doc take your medicine. We'll be back in a moment. I'm going to go take my pills now. Okay. <laughs> Hello, Doc. Hello, Hello Doc. Hello, Doc. Hello, Doc. But if we come back, Homer Jones, I mean, Preacher, uh, uh, I mean, Milk, <laughs> and, he, and we were asking Milk, why, what's happening with Buffalo right now? Now, one thing we do know, Buffalo is a pretty good team, but it seems, Milk, as though they've been figured out. And you say it's some, something they're not doing now that they were doing in the past. What is it they're not doing that makes them the dominant team that they were a few weeks ago? Well, Tony, I think the template has been set is how you succeed in the NFL. You have to have a ground and pounded element to your football team. We've been screaming for weeks trying to get the watch football team to be faithful to the run. And so uh, Buffalo, I think, is being exposed now because defenses have found a way to stop uh, the quarterback up there and to default back to a running game. That running game wasn't there to begin with at the beginning of the season. I think they had Singletary and, you know, he was just there for, for, for team dressing. And so uh, now that they need a running game going into the latter part of the season, uh, especially if you're going to go to playoff time uh, or you have aspirations to go playoff, you got to have a running game. And so that, that's why I think the hey, Buffalo. Hey, Milton, Kansas City doesn't have a running game. They just beat you through the air. Well, and what what, what Kansas City has, well, Ka Kansas City does have a Patrick Mahomes. Yeah. And so that's the distinguishing <laughs> difference there. Uh, 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 they brought back uh, um, Alaya this past uh, weekend so they will get better in the running game they've had a running game but i'm just saying any team that's going to be consistent and show up uh and 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 be respected in the uh, uh postseason play you've got to have a running game and i don't know of another team that's done it any better if you wait over my tenure than just watching uh uh uh, uh, uh scripts uh, designed for john riggins to just go left just go right just go up the middle it's the same thing but you got to be able to run the ball you got to be JB, you see how he got he got Washington back in there. He brought John Riggins yeah. back out. <laughs> That's what I'm on. He, he worked his way all the way around. Hey, Kelsey, now he's talking in, in the AFC, and we're looking at them a few weeks ago. They we said they were the dominant team. Right now, do you think they're the dominant team? Or do you think they have flaws enough that some other team, and you tell us which one are, is one that needs to be watched? Yeah, you know, I think he makes such good points about Buffalo, but I think the fun thing about the AFC right now is that it truly is anyone's game because all of these teams, it's like one day they look like this, the next day they look like that. And I really am trying to find who the real team is in the AFC. And I'm going to go right over the highway, all right? I'm looking at Baltimore. I know there's many questions about the Baltimore Ravens, but when you look at the Baltimore Ravens, I know their defense has been abysmal. Like this is not the Ravens defense that we've come to know as of late. But also let's remember, this is a Baltimore Ravens team that at one point had 16 players on IR and we've talked about on the show players stepping up they've had playmakers step up on both sides of the football Lamar Jackson finally has weapons Mark Andrews is a tight end that's not talked about enough when Lamar is able to connect with him they are very good together when Marquise is Hollywood and I, I use his names interchangeably sometimes he plays like Marquise sometimes he plays like Hollywood but when he's able to hold on to that long ball and play like Hollywood Lamar has that there and then you look at also Lamar Jackson when you talked about a running game Milton the Baltimore Ravens lost all the backs and somehow incredibly we're still able to have a running game in Baltimore and Lamar Jackson is a large reason uh, a part of that and Lamar I mean he's doing everything he needs to do he's playing from behind right and even now I think there were many questions if Baltimore could win that game JB you talked about Tyler Huntley and the Ravens were still able to win that game even with Lamar Jackson being an announced an hour before that he couldn't play in that game I think I look at the Ravens because they're scary because you just don't know which team you're going to get week in and week out you might get that team that lost to Miami or you might get that team that beat the Kansas City Chiefs with the Baltimore Ravens, right? So you just don't know. So I look at Baltimore, they're as good as their wide receivers, as Sammy Watkins can be solid, uh, Duvernay, and I mean, so many other playmakers that they have on that football team. If everybody steps up as the Ravens have shown they can, and if the defense can give back to being their identity, I really do like the Baltimore Ravens. I think they're tired of being second place in the AFC all the time to Kansas City. But I do have to mention too, Tony, Kansas City is hitting their groove at the right time, yep. right? Kansas yep. City is hitting their groove <laughs> at the right time. Out. And it's scary. Patrick Mahomes and everything is working. And you best believe that win over Dallas has Kansas City riding high right now, feeling like themselves once again in November 
remember when it matters very much in football. But again, watch out for the Baltimore Ravens. John Harbaugh is a proven coach. Lamar Jackson, I mean, he's proven he's Houdini and can get anything done. And when healthy, we talked about also the vaccination. Lamar Jackson's vaccination status bothers me a lot. His third illness this year. But if Lamar Jackson is healthy, watch out for the Baltimore Ravens. And I like Baltimore. And you have some great points there at the same time. They depend on Jackson too much. And if anything happens to him, the whole thing goes down. Even though they have a good defense, a good running game, with everything, but he stirs the pot and makes it happen. Now look at Kansas City, and I tell you, you tell you what, JB, uh, the young young quarterback was having Mahomes was having his problems a, little, a few weeks ago, but it looks as though he's come around. But that defense, to me, even though they had a good game on Sunday, is still questionable of them being a top tier team this year. You know what? And I look in all the years that I've been blessed to watch and cover the league and talk to guys like you to get some insight. You know, defense still is the difference maker. Look at what Tampa did last year against Kansas City with that defense. I mean, they hit him in the mouth. They were tough. I mean, the defense, what, what's the defensive coordinators down there? Come on, what's his name? Are you talking about Todd? Todd, 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 Bowles. Todd, Todd, Bowles. Bowles, had, Todd Bowles had the perfect game plan for them. Kansas City still doesn't have a powerful running game. You still need those fundamental elements yeah. from my humble perspective to get it done game in and game out and certainly at the big time. You know, you talk about Baltimore, look at the number of running backs that they did lose early in the season because they were going to, that's right, Doc, three of them. Now, the difference is Lamar Jackson, he's a preternatural talent because every defensive coordinator is still worried about him. Marquez Valdez Scanling. Uh, Scandling with the uh, uh, Green Bay said it best when he tweeted this one game because everybody's watching Lamar. They still got a scout on him, so he is the run game. So if he's a if he's attracting attention, somebody all they need is just a little bit of an opening, and Lamar can give them the ball. But I love what MVS said: eight different. He's a different dude altogether because they're still looking at him. But you know what? A team that could potentially, and I would listen to the three of you guys who played the game to see whether or not they've got enough other weapons there. But that young fellow, Jonathan Taylor with Indianapolis, yeah. the boy flat Bull. out and played, uh -huh. and he got Bull. it done. And if, in fact, they continue to ride him, just like when Donna and Kelsey were talking about Derrick Henry, people, the guys on our show this past week, they were saying, who's the real MVP on Tennessee? Is it is it Ryan Tannehill or is it Derrick Henry? Man, is Derrick Henry. Give me a break. <laughs> And I love Brian Tannehill. He's a good dude. I like him. But he ain't nothing without Derrick Henry back there. Good. And now Carson Wentz can be a little bit better at making decisions with that young fellow, Jonathan Taylor, who can flat out ball. He can get it done. And O-line and their defense, <laughs> oh, they Doc, run to the ball. O -line. Hey, Doc, talk about that O-line. Yeah. The, the O-line, D-line, the Colts have the whole thing. It's about two, Wentz, who's a nut. But, I mean, let's face it, but what quarterback has been really good is not. I mean, so I'm just telling you, you're right. Andy, the horseshoe could come out of this thing on top. Mm. Let, me, let me lay a little. Let me lay a little. Whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah. Hold on. Hold on, Homer. I'm going to you when we come back. But you know what? We got a DJ down here. And when he says the right thing, everybody holler, say, say it. Y'all say the right thing, right? <laughs> But after running back there, nothing. When we come back, I'll get that from you. Homer, you too. We'll be back. There's no Vina. Welcome back. And as you know, we were just laughing during the time out about things changing around the league and people changing everything. And Milt, you were making a point when we went out. Uh, you yeah, to I, just, that? I just wanted to say real quickly, and I was glad that JB brought it up. When we look at Jonathan Taylor and that running game out, uh, out there at uh, Indianapolis um, um, and being a homer, I wanted to give a shout out. Uh, to John Settle, who used to be a running back here for the Washington football team, and he coached the linebackers, I mean, the uh, running backs, uh, for several years out there in Wisconsin, and he had Jonathan Taylor, so he's done a great job with him. He ran hard in college just like that, and he's only gotten better in the pros. So I, I say kudos to that. He's he's a beast. He is a beast. Hey, Tony, Kelsey, one who, team who, who, that we haven't mentioned, and I know we've been talking about other teams, but Arizona. Nobody has mentioned Arizona because when you look at them, when they get Hopkins back, They've got the offensive line that's playing well. They've got a great defense out there. They've got a running game. To me, they are a complete team 
uh, when they get some of those bodies back. And we haven't mentioned Arizona and they're quietly just rolling along in the NFL. And I think that's the team to watch also. I do too, because they got a lot of parts and they won without the quarterback. And I tell you, that's very important. And JB, you had a point you were making. Well, I want to ask Gary Clark about the Dallas Cowboys from the standpoint, the last, it seems to be three, four weeks, the running game just hasn't been there. I'm, I'm thinking about the numbers in, in very general terms about Ezekiel Elliott, and they're just not getting it done. What's happening from your perspective? I just think Ezekiel's not healthy. I don't think he's fully healthy, and I think he's he, he's playing hurt, but he's – and look, he got a little nicked up again on a play. But number 20 is not a bad running back for that whole season. <laughs> oh, like, he's, he's awesome. Coming out, of, coming out of nowhere. And quite mm -hmm. honestly, it may be a reason why they may try to push Ezekiel out. But if he goes somewhere else, he's going to be a killer. He's going to kill wherever where he goes. I mean, he's just – That's why Ezekiel's playing – playing hurt that's why he's running hurt because Pollard is pushing him for his for his spot I believe yeah, yeah. I, I, I would play hurt I played hurt because you had great players behind you that could actually take their position so you're going to play hurt you just got to perform when you do hey mm -hmm. hey Comer if you don't play hurt you'll play hungry <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. but really has Ezekiel really played well the last three years I mean, to me, he hasn't played well since he came back from that one injury, and he hasn't been the same since then. Uh, I don't know if it's, you know, as far as, like you said, the offensive line, but to me, he hasn't been the same player since he came back from that injury when he was out almost like that whole year. Kelsey, you, you agree with that, huh? Yeah, his production has definitely went down. I actually talked to his father, Stacey Elliott, earlier this year, and he said, you know, we talked about Zeke gaining the weight back, you know, really trying to put on for this team, but he just hasn't been able to do that. Now, luckily, Dallas has been solid on the offensive side of the ball. We had questions about Dak coming back. He's come back. And look, Dak is back, even though I think even he is still getting to 100%. And of course, that defense, I don't think anybody expected that defense, but also a team I'd like to mention that I think could make some noise that we're not talking about enough is the New England Patriots. I was not a Mac believer when he first came in. I had many questions about Mac Jones, but shortly and sweetly, the New England Patriots are getting the job done. And once again, wow. look at that AFC picture. It's very tight. So I do think the New England Patriots are starting to earn respect and they are a team that you do have to keep an eye on. I tell you what, I'm proud of you guys. You guys hit a lot of nice teams. I like that New England Patriots in the end. Now, when we come back, we'll tell you who we think is going to win certain games. But Mike Baker has a special tribute. We'll be back in a moment. Well, as I told you going out, we have Mike Baker. He has some special things that he needs to say about a special individual that used to be part of the Washington football team. Yeah. Sam Huff, Tony. Sam Huff was a West Virginia kid. Uh, he was born in Edna, West Virginia. He played for West Virginia University. He was drafted by the NFL in 1956 in the third round. He played for the Giants and the Redskins and is in both teams' ring of fame. He was elected to five Pro Bowls. He was an All-American on the field. Most people don't know that he was also an academic All-American. And that the 4-3 scheme was developed for Huff by Giants defensive coordinator Tom Landry. Sam was the first guy to play in the middle, middle linebacker. He led the Giants to the 1956 World Championship. He joined the Redskins in 1965 and helped beat his former team, the Giants, 72 to 41 in the highest scoring game in NFL history. Upon retirement, he was a top selling salesman with the Marriott Corporation. That's that academic background. In 1982, Sam was inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. In 1986, Sam, Sam began uh, breeding thoroughbred racehorses. He was responsible for helping establish the West Virginia Breeders Cup. He raised millions of dollars to help keep thoroughbred racing alive in Charlestown, which is alive today. Finally, the trio of Sonny, Sam, and Frank calling Washington Redskin games is legendary. Sam never gave in. It was his defense that won games. It sounds like Tony McGee to me. Tony. Yeah, I had Doc Walker on my team. Oh, yes. <laughs> but if you think about it, Sam Huff was really the first middle linebacker that made the position famous. And when he got in there and he played with two great teams and he was a great player, but as you said, even afterwards, he was a very good broadcaster and he was a good person. Yeah. It's interesting uh, it, being a being a, a, a tadpole in their environment. It's like being a BT working with James Brown. When you're working with people that have had that level of popularity, he was the first defensive star in the league. Period. I mean, I always tell people when you were 12, who were you in the backyard? 
I was John Unitas until Dick Butkus. Everybody thinks Dick Butkus was the most famous. No, no, it was Sam Huff first, then Dick Butkus, then Ray Nischke. You know, you start thinking, and then, and then we never had an African American middle linebacker until the Chiefs came up and Willie Lanier. Boy, so man. the positions of influence and, and power, we were not allowed to play. So I was very focused on this. And then to meet Sam, and yeah, he was a big time guy. And he wasn't a jerk. He could have high sided or whatever. Never did that. If you were a player or you played or whatever, he gave you respect. But take no bones about it. He was a linebacker on and off the field. Hey, and Doc, I loved his game. Hey, Doc, in here just last week in the studio recording inside the NFL to hear Ray Lewis talk with reverence about Sam Huff just brought it home to me because I just knew him, of course, as a part of that iconic broadcast team that uh, Mike and uh, and uh, Tony just referenced, uh, therefore, the Washington football team. Yeah. Mm -hmm. May it so well, rest well, Tony's team. an example. I mean, <laughs> most guys on defense, because they couldn't play often, so they put people <laughs> back in there. So, you know, if a guy was slew foot, you know, whatever, he couldn't get out of his way, then they put him on defense. It wasn't until here recently to where athletes and guys, scholars, started playing defense. But you know what? They also, they put us on, on defense, but they put the guy that couldn't play on the offense on the bench. And with that being said, <laughs> <laughs> with that being said, let's look at this next game. If they can't get on a roll, and as I said, Sam, rest in peace, because he's a great person. Very quickly, you got to tell me, who do you think? Washington, Seattle, Monday night. Let's start with you, Donna. Uh, Tony, uh, Russell Wilson may be back uh, for that game, but so will possibly Logan Thomas, uh, the, the tight end for Washington, who's been out. But if Washington plays like they have been the last two weeks, they can walk away winning three games in a row. So I'm going to give it to the Burgundy and go. Scott? Yeah, I think they should win the game. Russell is already back. He's just not playing well. Right. Their offense is awful. And defensively, you got one guy trying to do everything. They're a shell of themselves. I'll be pissed off if we don't beat them. Kels. Yeah, this is not the same old Seahawks team. Russell Wilson is still trying to get his groove back. I don't think it's going to be this game. I have Washington winning, and uh, DMV is very own. Wale will be there. So I think it'll be a great homecoming for this Washington football team. G. Uh, well, Washington football team. So Homer, we know. Well, Gary took the words right out of my mouth because he's a homer too. <laughs> I agree. Russell Wilson is back. Uh, he's not what he used to be, and so uh, and we we've, we've been playing ball control for the last couple of weeks, which has been very refreshing to see. Clock control. I mean, Washington takes this game. Mike. It's been a long time since the Washington team won the time of possession two games in a row and bested the other team in third down conversions as well as total yardage. I'm telling you, Washington's on a roll, run the ball. And I lead this, this Washington team can't worry about past failures. All they got to worry about is future considerations and they can win and they will win. With that being said, we'll be back next week and we're going to try to get JB to come back and Kelsey, you guys have been great. Doc? We got a, a number we want you to call. <laughs> no, it's okay. Go, it was just great to see Kels and CJB. Everybody else is in the working media. Okay, guys. Hey, All hey, have Doc, a safe Doc can Come. you bring, can you make sure Novena is on the show next time? I'll be there. <laughs> JB. Hey, J no, JB. I hey, JB, I can't. JB, that's it. never happened. <laughs> JB, it's that's that's never it. happened. <laughs> yeah, if that happened, We'd all be in trouble. You See, don't I want thought, that. I, I thought Tony McGee was going to host the show this week. Isn't that Lovey Smith over there? <laughs> well, I tell you, that is good. That's yeah, that that. Is good. That <laughs> is better than mine. I yeah, like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, guys. Thank you, guys. It has been great. And you know what? We'll be back. And if we always say, we never say goodbye. We say, in the minute.